Please welcome Anu Bradford, Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organisation, Columbia Law School, Helen Dixon, Commissioner for Data Protection, Republic of Ireland, and Bloomberg's Chad Thomas. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, panel on the Brussels effect, where we'll be looking at how the EU has really become the regulator of the world. But I want to engage all of you in the audience to start this off, so if you all can get your phones out and get ready, and if you haven't, uh, don't have the QR code yet, make sure that you uh, have that up on your screen, because we want to start with a polling question, and this is a polling question about something that everyone in this room has been affected by, and in fact, are you affected by it every single day, and that has to do with the cookies that pop up when you open a website. And we have three questions for you, and we want you to weigh in on this. When you see this, do you think, this is great, this is the EU protecting my privacy? B, this is incredibly annoying, please make it go away and see privacy, what privacy is there in a digital world. And while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to ask Helen to weigh in here with some special thoughts, her <laughs> side, on what she thinks about all of this. Well, I'm not surprised to see that the results are a majority saying, this is incredibly annoying, please make it stop. Uh, in fact, this e-privacy law that governs the settings of cookies um, uh, in the EU has been in place now for well over a decade and is in need of reform. That's recognised in the EU, but the negotiations for a new e-privacy regulation have been stalled now for quite some time. So I would be in agreement. It really does need reform. There are some theories that there's no need uh, for rules around setting of cookies on devices, that it's the further processing of the data after the cookie is set that's important, and that can be picked up by the GDPR and regulatory offices like my own. So, yeah, not surprised that it's so causing annoyance. would you annoyance. fall in the B category then, too, a little bit? I, I would fall into the B <laughs> category myself, yes. How, how about you, Anu? No, I, I completely agree that this is not necessarily all that the EU can accomplish and has accomplished through regulation. So it's visible and it is often annoying, but there's so much more happening on the, on the back, uh, backstage of all that um, that is extremely important, but this is not the EU regulation at its best necessarily. Well, Anna, you literally coined the phrase Brussels effect in uh, your last book. What did you mean by that? So the, the term is meant to capture this global unilateral regulatory power that the EU has. So the EU is one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world. And there are very few global companies that can afford not to trade in the EU. So as the price for accessing the European market, these companies need to obey European regulations. That's not surprising. But often these companies choose that they will extend the European standards across their global conduct and their global production because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes. So there are benefits to standardization, the benefits to uniform production. So all the EU needs to do is to regulate the single market. And it's then the market forces and the business incentives of global companies that transform that EU rule into a global rule. And that's what I mean by the Brussels effect. Helen, you have really been at the forefront of this. It's your office that has been, from the GDPR point of view, really on the front lines. You've handed out hundreds of millions in fines in, in, in recent years. Where do you think you are at in sort of the enforcement process? Well, we're coming up to five years of application of GDPR, but it's still early days because you just mentioned we've handed out hundreds of millions, actually over a billion last year alone, in fines and also corrective measures that we've imposed, in particular on some of the world's largest platforms. But what we're also seeing is as fast as we hand out uh, those enforcement measures, the issues are being contested in court, and perhaps that's not surprising. There's no big back catalogue of case law in this area of law, and we're seeing very new novel applications and application of the law to very novel technologies. So I think where we're at is that we're going to see uh, a, a lot of case law now arising from the enforcement actions the DPC has taken. We're going to see some big judgments from the Irish High Court, perhaps references off to the CJU. 
and we're going to get to a point of greater legal certainty as we start to see these definitive rulings from the court that are coming off the back of very detailed, well laid out investigations my office has conducted. We're setting up the courts, I suppose, to, to give the definitive word on some of these big issues about data protection by design, data protection by default, how you deliver transparency to users, um, what legal basis you can use to collect and process personal data. So very fundamental <laughs> kinds of issues. What do you say to people who, who, who argue that the process has moved too slow? Is it because you're, you're, you are setting case law essentially here that you really feel you have to build a very strong case before you move forward? Oh, that's undoubtedly the case. I think some of the people that comment on speed understand very little about the process of conducting an investigation, the complexity of finding the facts, the implementation of fair procedures in the process. Uh, so these things do take time to do properly. And if anyone has read the, the 200 page decisions ultimately that the office produces to ground the kind of enforcement measures we're implementing, they will understand a little bit about the detail. That said, uh, we all want things to speed up. We want to be able to conduct and conclude matters faster. But I think some of the issue that arises there is, uh, you know, your poll is interesting. What are people looking for? What is it that we're aiming for as the end result? So a lot of what we're looking at with the platforms are issues around this ad tech model, the free internet services, but funded by collecting personal data to better profile users to serve ads. What are we trying to get to? Do we want to eliminate the free model and have subscription only with data only collected to personalize the service? Um, I, I, I think there isn't a clear end goal and that's part of what's creating the contestation in the public's minds, but also on the part of platforms and regulators currently. Just want to remind the audience that you can submit questions as well, so please do send us your questions and we'll try to get some of those in. Anu, what do you think has been the broader impact of GDPR for the world? Yeah, so very quickly, just to follow up on also what Helen said, that ultimately speed is not the objective. So I, ideally, we can have speedy resolution of uh, various complaints, but we can see China charge ahead and regulate technology sector with tremendous speed. But when you work within the constraints of liberal democracy that is committed to rule of law, this needs to be thoughtfully crafted regulations that are implemented in the way that really observe the due process. So ultimately, um, I think there, there is a balance that always will be struck differently when you commit it to those, those principles. So even with some of the deficiencies in enforcement, I would say that the GDPR has had tremendous global impact. So it has completely shifted the privacy landscape in terms of the public consciousness, the public conversations, the demand uh, for privacy uh, regulation. And I would say the two ways that it has really impacted the rest of the world. So one is, as I mentioned, the companies themselves, irrespective of what kind of legal frameworks they face at home, they do uh, uh, adopt the GDPR as their global privacy standard. So some of the biggest tech giants, whether it's um, Apple or Microsoft or Google or Meta, they use the GDPR as their global privacy setting. But we also have governments around the world. We have over 130 governments that now have very GDPR type of regulations that they have adopted. So we also see this kind of legislative emulation of what the, the EU has done. So I think that is absolutely significant. We have the Digital Services Act, which is dealing primarily with sort of illegal content, mm -hmm. and then we have the Digital Markets Act, which is about competition, both coming to, into effect soon. What will you want to be looking for there as that comes into effect in the EU? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So those are extremely ambitious uh, regulations, and I think it's also telling of how the European bureaucracy can continue to generate regulations throughout very difficult times. So uh, the EU has retained its ambition to be a leader for the EU, but also increasingly for the world, because the world is watching how these ambitious regulations like the DSA and DMA will be implemented and how they will change the landscape, uh, uh, the regulatory landscape for these uh, companies. Uh, 
So I am uh, expecting there to be not necessarily a wholesale adoption across the world, but we have many governments that are looking what the EU is doing and are in the process of introducing similar regulations or variants thereof. Then I think it'll be very interesting to see how these global companies will adjust their business practices. Will they implement the obligations of those regulations only with respect to Europe or whether they do it globally? And sometimes it may be very difficult in today's conversation environment about uh, which is more hostile or more skeptical of the big tech companies. If Facebook, for instance, cannot use targeted advertising or Instagram cannot use targeted advertising on minors in Europe, can they then justify that they continue that very same practice in the United States and elsewhere? Because there will be many who say, well, you have ceased those activities in Europe. Don't you care about protecting our minors as well? And it is harder for reputational reasons uh, for Facebook, for instance, then to confine its, its uh, conduct and the changes it, it will have to make to Europe alone. So I think it, we, we will see some ramifications of those regulations outside of Europe as well. Helen, when you think about the work that you're doing now and then you have DSA, DMA coming into effect, an office like yours, do you feel you have the resources necessary to do that work, in particular when you're in many ways up against very big pocketed uh, big tech companies? So there's a couple of different aspects to that. Um, in terms of the DSA and the DMA, they will regulate different aspects of the platforms and there will be some overlap with the GDPR. So for example, under the Digital Markets Acts, the gatekeepers will be constrained from sharing personal data across the various services without the consent of users. Uh, under the Digital Services Act, uh, I, I think Anu mentioned there will be a prohibition on targeting children uh, uh, using their personal data. So a lot of the, the newer regulation is going to positively impact in the direction that the DPC is also working in enforcing the GDPR. We will not be the enforcer of these other instruments, but the big challenge for us uh, and, and for the, the Data Protection Commission as an office is going to be now to coordinate with the EU Commission in its enforcement role with the various competent authorities in the different member states and in Ireland that are going to be taking up these roles. And in all of that, as well as the coordination burden to make it coherent and to have a coherent message to the platforms we regulate, there's also the issue of how the man and person, woman on the street, experiences these laws. How are they deriving the benefits? Do they have to know, I want to complain under this regulation or that regulation? How do we make it a, a, a coherent improvement for the welfare of all users? So, so that's kind of a big focus at the moment. Well, I think it says something about the work that you're doing that I believe you told me that you're, you're going to be <clears throat> stepping down towards the end of the year and your role is going to be split in three. <laughs> That, that's not exactly the sequence <laughs> of, of events. In fact, last year the government has decided that they want to implement a three-person commission uh, as the legislation underpinning the remit of my office provides for. So, so that is intended to happen at some point by coincidence, as you say, my own second and final term as commissioner. Uh, will be coming to an end relatively shortly. So, yes, the future will look a little bit different in terms of the decision-making and governance model at the Irish Data Protection Commission. Uh, anu, I don't know if you have been following sort of Twitter's response so far under DSA, and I'm wondering what your initial thoughts are on that. Some people have suggested it's a little bit underwhelming. Yes, yeah, so I think... Uh, Many of us are sort of watching to see what happens to Twitter when they have let go a lot of the key personnel that have been in charge of their They have no Brussels clients. office anymore. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I, I think it was telling that the moment when the, the sale finally was completed and Elon Musk was getting ready to take over the company and he tweeted that the bird is freed. And it took a few hours for the Commissioner Breton to respond that in Europe the bird, the bird will fly by our rules. So I don't think Twitter will be immune. Uh, I think the DSA will be vigorously enforced against Twitter. 
And uh, so uh, there will be limits to how much the American sort of market-driven free speech doctrine can be implemented in places like the EU. Helen, your office uh, drafted a, had a draft decision on Meta uh, last year regarding the transatlantic data transfers. Can you give us an update on where that is and what I, I think the final decision should be coming fairly soon and sort of what we can expect from you there? Mm, that's right. And I was actually thinking of this whole issue of EU to US transfers yeah. when Anu was talking about the Brussels effect because no doubt her thesis is correct. Europe has exported not just its standards, but people say its moral view of how, how data protection and data privacy should work. And we've certainly seen that tension as an office over the last number of years because of our particular involvement in this issue of EU to US data transfers, where you see sometimes a very negative reaction, particularly when the Court of Justice of the European Union struck down the Privacy Shield in 2020. You see a reaction on the US side of who made the EU the boss of the world mm -hmm. and why does it get to, to dictate uh, what, what US national security agencies can do in terms of collection of personal data. So you're right, that case that is central to all of that context is coming to a conclusion very soon. It's an investigation the DPC opened on foot of that CJU judgment back in 2020. Uh, and ultimately it will uh, decide whether uh, Meta's, Facebook's, rather the Facebook service transfers from the EU to the US are lawful. Uh, and whether they can continue. So the final decision will issue from my office before the 12th of May. I want to change subjects to AI, which is something that uh, everyone has uh, been abuzz about. Anu, what will you be looking for from the EU when it comes to regulation? So um, again, the EU is here taking the lead. It has, uh, the Commission has proposed a very ambitious uh, AI regulation that is now in the moving uh, through the legislative process and we are expecting to have the regulation out um, still uh, finalized this year. Obviously now with the arrival of ChatGPT, there has been kind of a wrinkle in the, in the legislative process when the European lawmakers are trying to decide how to think about this, this kind of, this variant of uh, AI and whether these large language models um, could be considered um, high risk uh, uh, AI applications, which would then subject them to rather elaborate regulatory requirements. So, um, but regardless, I think there will be a solution to that, potentially, for instance, that there's no sort of generic labeling that the chat GPR type of uh, technology would always be considered high risk, but when it is applied in a high risk settings, then the regulatory obligations would kick in, but, but uh, that, that will, remains to be seen. But regardless, the EU will charge ahead and there will be an AI regulation uh, coming out of the, the EU. And it's really interesting because now the entire world is discussing how to regulate the AI. And there are very few voices, even among the companies, who would be prepared to say that we do not need to be regulated. So there is a lot of demand for a template on how to regulate uh, AI, and I think uh, a lot of the regulators are looking into the EU's leadership here as well. So that I think just tells us that Brussels has tremendous uh, influence and there is, it can be good or bad. If the EU gets it right, it has the potential to get it globally right. But if the EU gets it wrong, also uh, those deficiencies uh, or misguided regulations may have an impact outside of the EU. Do you think, Helen, with AI, it moves so quickly, can the regulation keep up? Oh, I think I, I fully agree with Anu. Uh, it, it needs to be regulated, and it's about figuring out how to regulate it properly. I think there's been a little bit of a focus in recent weeks only on chat GPT, and of course, in reality, there are thousands of equivalents of OpenAI's chat GPT coming onto the market, so it isn't just about one company's um, product. I, I think the issues span much broader, of course, than data protection. There are copyright issues, there are issues about whether an individual could be defamed by what these generative AI large language models are producing. There are all sorts of, of issues as well as data protection issues. 
for the Irish Data Protection Commission, where we are at is trying to understand a little bit more about the technology, about the large language models, about where the training data is sourced, looking a little bit at understanding first so that we can come to a view first and foremost in terms of our own remit about the application of the GDPR to it, but we also want to contribute to broader discussions about the risks and about other areas of law that converge in AI. So I think it's early days, but it's time to be having those conversations now rather than um, rushing into prohibitions that really aren't going to stand up. I know some say that uh, the US and China is where people innovate and the EU and Europe is where people regulate. You have a different view though, I know. No, Tell so us about that. I think there is a merit to that argument in many ways that the EU has become its global superpower is that it is a regulatory superpower, but we do not have many big European tech companies. So there is this very entrenched perception that it is because of regulation the European tech companies have not managed to succeed here. And I'm not willing to sort of defend that all regulation is good. I think there's regulation, for instance, that is protectionist or that is stifling. But I do not believe that because of the GDPR, there are no big European tech companies or because the EU has been ambitious with its antitrust regulations. So I believe that there are other reasons that explain why the EU has a lot of work to do in order to, to also regain its place as an innovator. But I would rather lay the blame with, with other issues, mainly the lack of a digital, completed, integrated digital single market. It's very hard for European tech companies to scale in Europe. We've talked a lot about yesterday uh, in the sessions about capital markets union. So it's a very different environment to raise money for startups in the EU. There's not the same depth and integration uh, in financial markets as there are in the US. I would um, uh, single out punitive bankruptcy laws that, that really deter risk taking. In Europe, failure is, is often fatal, whereas in Silicon Valley, it's the rite of passage that you move on and, and start fundraising again. And finally, and this is, I think, really important, the Americans, in contrast to Europeans, have been very skillful in harnessing the global talent. To, to fuel their innovation ecosystem. And the Europeans does not, haven't managed to replicate that. So there's, I think, a lot that Europeans need to do, but um, you know, ceasing to enforce regulations like the GDPR or, or pulling away from the ambitious antitrust enforcement agenda, not going ahead with thinking about AI regulation, that's not, to me, where the, the primary problem lies. Um, you've said, though, that there is a risk that the EU could fall into protectionism. So what do you have to be careful of there, do you think? Yeah, so that does, does concern me. So in the Brussels Effect book, I was defending uh, the, the EU for not being motivated by this envy-driven protectionism, that that's not primarily what is, what is behind the EU regulations. But the environment has shifted considerably in the couple of, last couple of years. And uh, I think there's much more demand for converting tools like competition policy into tools for industrial policy. Um, the state is very much back in, whether it's in the United States or the EU through subsidies. Um, but there is the, the kind of environment when the EU is regulating in the shadow of the US-China tech war that it's tempting to become more protectionist. And, and those voices, I think, have grown louder now that the UK is outside of the EU and not shaping those conversations from within the EU. There's much more space for the Franco-German preferences to prevail and shape that conversation. So I do remain concerned of the rise of protectionist regulation. And I think we should keep in mind that the Brussels effect is an effective tool to export good and bad regulations alike. So if the EU turns to protectionist regulation, we can expect our companies to confront those regulations in the rest of the world as well. And that doesn't serve well the EU's competitiveness and, uh, and the goals around strategic autonomy. In our few moments that we have left, uh, Anu, you have a new book coming out later this year. Can you give us just a quick sneak peek at what you'll be looking at there? Oh, great. Uh, thank you, Chad. So I have a book called Digital Empires the global battle to regulate technology that is coming out in September. And that is really looking the contest between the US and China and the EU to regulate technology, where we have the American market-driven view 
uh, the Chinese state-driven view and the European rights-driven view and how they battle for influence in the global marketplace. So America exporting its private power, its companies, China exporting its infrastructure power and the EU uh, exporting its regulatory power uh, on technology. But I think ultimately the, the big question that the book takes on in the end that what the battle ultimately culminates in is what happens to liberal democracy. And I think that battle can be lost in, in one of two ways. So one is if the EU and the US will lose the horizontal battle to China and the world is turning to digital authoritarianism. But also if the US and the EU lose their vertical battle to tech companies and ultimately we have the tech companies and not people like Helen regulating the digital economy. That's also not a victory for democracy. And I think few of us would think that China will lose its battle to its tech companies, but we are not yet sure if we have found a way for democratic governments to effectively govern technology. And I think that conclusion that there is no democratic model to do it effectively would be very unsettling. And I think a clear message that the US and the EU cannot lose that battle. Helen, you will be stepping down uh, later this year uh, after a decade on the job. What advice would you give to your successor? Well, I suppose we've been talking a lot this morning about exporting, exporting our regulation, and the Irish Data Protection Commission is central to that EU export in terms of our enforcement role and our adv advocacy role for rights in particular. So I suppose the advice I would give is that while I sit here as a national independent supervisory authority, that recognition of the role of Ireland and the Irish DPC as being global in effect, global in reach, and having global stakeholders would need to be embraced by my successor. I think I started too late positioning permanent staff out in Brussels, which I'm just now doing, this year in acknowledgement that the European Parliament, the Commission, a lot of NGOs and other stakeholders are based there. A much broader communications campaign that takes in the global remit in reality of the office, I think would be warranted for attention by my successor. <laughs> Successors. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.